Amen and amen, amen. Let's look at Acts, the second chapter. The book of Acts, the second chapter. Hallelujah. Everybody doing well tonight? And the church says, Amen. amen. Hallelujah. Acts 2, 38, And Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So in other words, every one of us are called to his worship. It's promised to us even throughout all generations. And with many other words that he exhort, testify and exhort, saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Immediately, 3,000 souls were added. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine, fellowship, breaking bread, and in prayer. These are the four pillars that we've been, we, we started Sunday. And fear came upon every soul. Why? Did fear come upon every soul? That word fear is, is not a fright, but a reverence unto the Lord, a respect unto God, a reverential fear of God. How many people know what I'm talking about? You, you know, you, you sense the awesome presence of God. And you know that before Him, you are but an open heart to Him. Amen? And fear came upon many, upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Now, the Holy Spirit shared this last Sunday, but also, let me reiterate this again, that... For there to be a manifestation of the power of God, which in this verse in 43, he talks about wonders and signs. Look at that again. Wonders and signs. We need the wonders and signs. We need miracles. We need the lame to walk. We need the blind to see. We need the dead to resurrect. We need the sick healed. And you and I should be hungry for this move of God. You should be hungry for the move of God. And, and we wonder why the move is no longer there. And then we say, well, it's not the time of God. No, no, I think we, we try to dismiss our lack of, of anointing. Do you hear what I'm saying? The lack of anointing. There's no anointing. There's no power. You have no anointing. You have no power. And believe that's one of the one of the awful place to be. When there's no anointing. And so, in order for the signs and wonders to come back in the body of Christ, there has to be that reverential fear awesomeness that God is present that when God is present everything you do will be honored that God is in your presence I mean listen when God is in your presence listen you can't turn a thought away from that because that's where the presence is at that very moment. The, the, the hindering of God's spirit is so sensitive. You, 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 you sadden his spirit. You, you, uh, I like the word in Spanish is entristes. That, that word brings it more. It, the word entriste means that you sadden, but with the thought of it, you cause God to bring tears to his heart when there's no awareness of his presence. That's why um, every one of us need that fear of his presence so that we can see the breakthrough in our lives. 
Verse 44 says, And all that believed were together and had all things in common. And uh, they sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men. And every man had need, as every man had need. Need. In other words, the spirit of giving came. But you got to understand something. At the writing of this, the Jewish people were scared to be called Christians. So if they knew you were a Christian, you could not buy. You could not sell. Now I'm telling you, if you lived in at this writing, at this, at this revelation, Jesus Christ died on the cross. You believe that he resurrected and you're, you're believing the message of Peter, but now you're fearing for your life because there are a bunch of people that do not believe the way you believe. Now, at that writing, they couldn't go to the store and buy things. At that writing, you couldn't. You couldn't, be, you couldn't feel free to walk in the streets. Come on, church. So in other words, it took the church that was blessed of God to be able to help the need of those that needed help. And so the move of God was great. Think about it. It says that they had, they, get, they gave, they sold. Verse 46, they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all people. Favor with all people, it seems like it contradicts the first verses, but favor with all people, meaning that they were people that were getting saved left and right. 3,000 were added to the Lord. That means that person that came to the Lord, you gained favor. There was a favor among the body. Hallelujah. Amen. It's like, it's like all of us. We, we love one another. We will do whatever it takes to help one another, and we will be there. But the thing that we, we, we don't see or we kind of don't really understand is the need of a believer with another believer. I'm telling you, if I ever get into a situation that I need the church, I will definitely call upon the church. You know, that time that I broke my knee, uh, we were in Hawaii. <laughs> Christine got a hold of you guys, and you guys immediately started praying. Praying. And do you know what? Uh, I felt the prayer covering. I felt the church, and I was so thankful that the church was praying. I'm so glad that the church was praying. You see, you see the need that we have for one another? It's a need that we have for another. That's why when we, when we fear reverential, have the fear of God, and we follow these pillars, the Lord speaks to us, and he speaks to us in ways that will gain and bless one another. Hallelujah. Amen. In other words, he wakes you up to pray for Andrew. Hallelujah. Amen. And it benefits Andrew. He, he wakes you up and prays for Brother Bo, and it benefits Brother Bo. You see what's happening? The church now is, is, is working. It's moving. It's living. Hallelujah. Amen. The power of God. Amen. Let's look at these four pillars, and let's look at some scripture. The first one, the doctrine. I want to show you what Jesus said about the doctrine here. Amen. Now, notice what it says in John, the seventh chapter. I want you to see this. I've read this over before. But I saw something here that I need you to see. The Holy Spirit, I, the Holy Spirit revealed it to us. John 7, verse 14. Hallelujah. Amen. Speaking about the first pillar, verse 17 of John 7. In fact, look at verse 16. If, excuse me if you took notes. Just scratch it and put a six. Jesus answered them and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that set me. Now get, get a hold of this now. My doctrine, Jesus said, is not mine, but his God that sent me. Verse 17, this is where the key is at also. If any man will do God's will... God shall, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Come on, church. See, see, 
Everything that the disciples did was based upon the word of God, which was his will. If you ever question anything in life and wonder what God would say about it, find God's word and make it your word and you'll succeed. And notice this, it's got to be God's word. So in other words, Jesus said, you will know the doctrine if it is of me or if it is of someone else. So in other words, this is where we have to be so clear about the doctrine of God. We have to know the doctrine. In other words, in this house, and I'm going to speak about the Oasis now, in this house, we have one doctrine. And it is nothing but the word of God. Amen. Amen? There is no Oprah's philosophy. There is no Dr. Phil's thought. Although they're, they're interesting in some cases. It's all about what God says for us in this house. In other words, when I come to this house or when you come to this house, the doctrine that you're getting is his word. His will for our lives. And that builds you strong. One of the, fr the strongest, the strongest towers that you can ever have for a church is to have the doctrine in it. Strong doctrine. Wonderful doctrine. Holy Ghost doctrine. Amen. And remember, in order for you to know what the doctrine is, you've got to get in his word. And there was a, there was a, I don't know if it was true or not. It might have been a Bible teacher's thought, but when I was in Bible school, they said that, all the students came to class and the teacher uh, shocked all the students by, by uh, bringing in a speaker and he was a, a well, uh, was it you Jennifer that you told me about this? It was a well-known speaker, an evangelist really, a, an evangelist spoke a lot, um, mighty man of God. He came in and running and he, <laughs> and he was singing, uh, Mary had a little lamb in action as a preacher. In other words, it's a, you, you got this picture? Did everybody know what I'm saying? Evangelist, you know how an evangelist preaches? He preaches with gusto and power, and, and he, he's very emotional and some senses. Well, this preacher was known that, but when he came and ran in there, he started talking about Mary had a little lamb, and the whole crowd jumped. And they said, yeah, praise the Lord. He said, sit down. They were listening, not to the word, but they were looking at the, at the, the character of a person. And notice this, notice this, Bible students. So that tells me that we've got to hear and hear all together, hear the message of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm, that means tonight you've got to hear. You've got to hear, and you've got to hear, and that's what he's talking about here. So, in other words, in other words, God does not want you leaving from a place of worship that has His doctrine confused. He wants you to know without a shut of doubt. That's what the Word says. If that's what the Word says, I believe it. It settles it, and therefore I'm receiving what the Word of God says. Hallelujah. Amen. If Jesus says, speak to that mountain, and that mountain shall be removed, there's no question about it. You're going to speak to a mountain. Well, Pastor, a mountain will move. Jesus said it'll move. Don't you question it. Don't you question if a mountain will move. You know what I'm saying? And I believe that's what happens to a lot of young Christians. Uh, they don't understand speaking to a mountain. Well, you know, he's talking about the mountain that stands in your way. How many people believe that? Raise your hand. Oh, I believe it. Hallelujah. Amen. Go with me to Hebrews now. Talking about the doctrine, the first pillar. Hebrews. Now, when we were part of a Bible school in Mexico City, we were on the Board of Education there. We would fly twice a year to train students. And to this day, I'm so excited. All these students that graduate, now they're pastors. And uh, they have churches. And it's so wonderful. And, and, and you know, we missed their 20-year anniversary. Uh, their 20-year anniversary, right, Christine? We missed there. We wanted to go. And, and we should have went. But you know what? It, it just didn't happen. But anyway, I remember this particular chapter, verse chapter 6. Now, notice this. 
Therefore, chapter 6 of Hebrews, verse 1. I want everybody to see this. Now, the Bible says, therefore, listen to what Paul says in, in Hebrews, chapter 6, verse 1. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, which is actually one, and faith toward God, two, of the doctrine of baptisms, three, the laying on of hands, four, the resurrection of the dead, five, and of the eternal judgments, six. And we will do, we will, this we will do if God permits. In other words, if you see these six, these six foundational stones, that is the doctrine that you and I live by. Those six are the doctrine of the Bible. And if you look at it again, there shouldn't be any questions. Now, I remember when, we, when, when the board of directors asked me that if we would teach their pastors the doctrine of what you believe in and what God talks about and what the body of Christ needs to know. This is the first thing that the Holy Ghost said to me. This is what you're going to teach. And we taught this and we taught this and we taught. And it was opening eyes and people were saying, oh, I've never heard that. And there were pastors. And to this day, this day, they're standing on these six foundational stones. These stones are the ones that you and I need. Now look at it. Look at those again. I want you to see these. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, principles, principles, their main points of Christ, these main points of Christ, he says, let us go on to perfection, not laying again. In other words, there's more, come on church, there's more to receive after you know these foundations. If you don't know the baptisms of the Holy Spirit, then how can you move further with the presence of God under the Spirit of God? Amen. In other words, uh, you know, when you know why you get baptized, that's important. Why you speak in tongues, that's important. Why there's a resurrection. Why are we going to resurrect? Dear God, we're going to resurrect. Praise God. See, these are all fundamental principles that Jesus taught us. Hallelujah. Amen. And so there should be no question about that. Jesus Christ teaches the church. Now we learn these principles, but now we move on building upon these principles. Amen. So in other words, the number one pillar that the church needs is doctrine. Number one thing, the church needs. In order for signs and wonders to come into the church, there's got to be doctrine. Amen. And I've been, I've been in places, now, now I'm not going to say names, but I've been in places where there's no doctrine. Everything is disordered. Everything's out of order. And there's no move of God. And there's confusion. I hate those places. I hate them. I mean, literally, I, I'll, give you, I'll give you one example that Christy and I went to. I'll never forget this from the day I teach it. I know why this happens, and I, know, and I blame it on, number one, the pastor. I blame it on, on those that don't know the word, and the people should know, should know the word. We were, we, were, uh, we were in a church. They asked us to preach, and the Holy Spirit said, go ahead and go, because I'm going to break some strong things off this place. And I said, yes, sir, we'll go. And we started preaching, and, and there was a move of God. I'm telling you, there was a move of God that I've never seen before. I had to stop the service. I'm a visiting minister. I literally had to stop the service. I, I, there was a boldness that came on me that, was in, that, that, that there was error. There was a wrong spirit in that house. And I didn't care because I knew... The people needed to know this was out of order. You know what they were doing? There was a big bottle of olive oil on the pulpit. And they were pouring it over everybody while they were worshiping God. And then they got to a point that they were, <laughs> I kid you not, Pastor Christine's there. 
They started pouring it down people's throats. Now come on, church. Now some people were gagging the olive oil going down your throat, but they, it was just, I, I got up and said, stop. In the name of Jesus, I cast you out now. They all looked like I was there. And the thing about that was, that was a perfect time for me to go in there and teach them the word of God. Now, during the teaching of the word of God, I looked back and the pastor, right, Christine, was back here crying on his knees. Crying like a baby. Crying. Well, the Holy Ghost was convicting him. Because nowhere in the Bible does it say that. But yet the people think it's a normal thing. The people thought it was normal. What doctrine were they involved in? Where did they get this doctrine? What happened to this doctrine? You know what I'm saying, Bo? If you were there, bro, Bo, I tell you what, it was something else. I, you know, I, I, I have never seen that in my life. Now, a year went by, we were invited again, and I said, oh gosh, okay, we'll go. And it was totally different. The move of God was flowing in that place. The Spirit of God was moving, interpretations of tongues, healing, signs and wonders. Oh, I'm telling you, see, you, see the, you see the contrast here? The doctrine of Christ. Number one foundation, that's it, Bo, is to build a solid foundation. And the book of Acts had a solid foundation, and that's where we find the doctrine. Now remember, the doctrine instructs, leads, and informs and gives direction. Thank God for the doctrine. Amen. Say with me, amen. amen. Let, let, let's look at, go with me to uh, Philippians. Now, let's look at the second, the second uh, pillar that we see in the book of Acts. The second one, was, which is fellowship. We talked about fellowship being koinonia, which means communion. I, I like that about fellowship, meaning con communion, koinonia. Now, notice what it says in uh, Philippians. Philippians, the first chapter. Now notice, notice what Paul spoke to the church at Philippi in verse 3, chapter 1 of verse 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship. Look at that word. For your fellowship in the gospel. Your communion the gospel from the first day until now. Verse 6, being confident of this very thing that he which had begun a good work in you will perform it unto the day of Jesus Christ, even it is meet, that word meet is able, even it is able for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. Paul is saying, you are partakers of my anointing because of the koinonia that we have together. Now notice this, koinonia is a communion. It's, and in fact, the word communion is, is a joint participation, a sharing. There's an intimacy. Uh, in other words, when you and I come into the house of God, number one, having a doctrine that is solid, then the fellowship of the believers, the communion of the believers, what's happening? We are sharing together the anointing for that house. The anointing for that house. The anointing that God has graced this house. The anointing that he has placed upon the ministers of this house. The, see, there are anointings that are so prevalent for every believer. The anointing. You get under some anointing, you'll sense that anointing on you. I love it when, when I get under anointed preachers and teachers. Man, I sense that anointing on me, man. I sense it, hallelujah, amen. So I know that this house has an anointing. We're under that anointing. When we come together, there is a koinonia, a communion, a, a working relationship, an intimacy that's going on. And Paul said it very well. You are partners of this anointing. You're, you're sharing this anointing. Hallelujah. Amen. So that means that God has given us a special anointing to do something great for the kingdom of God. And God doesn't do things small. He does them great. 
He does it big, amen, strong. I tell you, God is a God. Now, we have to have patience. Now, as a pastor, boy, I have to have some patience, man, to wait on, uh, to wait that we can get to a point that God wants us to. You see, now, now, now I'll be frank with you and honest about something, very frank and honest about you. Do you know that God shows pastors or ministers of, of, the, of the worship, he shows them the direction where to go? In other words, I can't tell you that I don't know where we're going. I can't say that. That's not true. And if I didn't know where we're going, something's wrong with me. Now, I know where we're going. And I know we're going to get there. You ask me, what's the big picture of the Oasis? I can tell you. I see it. In fact, one preacher said it this way. Uh, he said, sometimes preachers see five years ahead of people. And I said, why, God? God needs you to see ahead so that you can make a beckoning call where you're going. If we don't know where we're going, then, dear Lord, then we'll just be misled. Do you know that? Do you know that? In this house, there's, there's regulations. There's things that we do that we don't do in any other place. In other words, the anointing help. God is directing us in this house how to run this house. And I love that about God. I told you years ago, uh, some of you have told that whenever I come into the house of God, I feel as a manager. I come in and every service when I come in and I sit in the front, I feel like a manager. I feel like there's someone greater that is leading this church. And I'm just waiting for him how to tell me what to do. I never come with an attitude, well, I know what we're gonna do. Yeah, yeah, this is what we're gonna do tonight. No, no. I come with an attitude, Father, what do you want to do tonight? What should we do next? And when we have that attitude, there's that working relationship that we have with God. There's that koinonia, that communion. God's in here. Oh, come on. Come on, church. Do you know what I'm saying? God is in here. And when he's in here, oh, hallelujah, you just want get out, to get, out get out of his way and let him do what he wants to do. Hallelujah. Amen. And get ready, get ready, get ready. Like old bishop says, get ready, get ready, get ready. Because something good is going to happen. Hallelujah. Amen. When the Holy Ghost is in the house, get ready, get ready. Hallelujah. Tell me, get ready, get ready. Hallelujah. Amen. So in other words, that's where we're going. Look at, look at uh, Proverbs, uh, excuse me. Philippians, the second chapter, we're not far from there. Look at the second chapter, verse 1. If there be any consolation in Christ, and if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, one with and of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in loneliness of mind, let each esteem others better than themselves. Verse 4, look not every man on his own thing, but every man also on the things of others. In other words, get your eyes off self. <laughs> That's really what he said. I love that about God. Get your eyes about self. It's not about you. It's about you being in the house of God with an anointing so that you can partake with others. Hallelujah. Amen. Come on, church. Listen, listen. There's no long rangers in the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. Amen. It's all needed for the anointing. Amen. Now, listen to this. We, we were invited to uh, participate in a gathering and we went because we were hungry for, for fellowship. And we went. And I noticed that the gathering was, no, 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 that's what I'm say. The gathering was for one purpose, was to, to grow a church. And the Holy Spirit says, guard your anointing. That's new to me. That was new to me. Guard your anointing. And so we went, and I noticed that, that, that everything was about giving me the pulpit or letting me talk. or It was always about calling upon Pastor Robert, Pastor Robert. And the Holy Spirit said, guard your anointing. 
And finally I said, okay, Lord, I need to know, what are you telling me? He said, this place is wanting your anointing. It's not about you. It's about what you have to grow what they need. And I thought, dear Lord, I never heard that before. This is where the scripture talks about it so clearly here. He says, when you gather together in fellowship and communion, it's the anointing together. So thank God that we have an anointing together. This house has an anointing. This pastor has an anointing. This church has an anointing. You have an anointing. So we're all together. So in other words, I don't have to guard my anointing in this house because this is a free anointing for all of us. God is gracious here. Hallelujah. I love God about the anointing in this house. Oh, come on, church. You know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm talking about. And let God use the anointing of, of me, of you, of every one of you. Let God use it. Hallelujah. Amen. That's why... We have to realize, today I was talking long distance to a minister, and uh, he was concerned about something, and I said, you know, how many hands, how many fingers does your hand have? Now, I want to ask you this. Go ahead. Look at your left hand. How many fingers does it have? Five, right? Everybody have five? Amen. Look at your other hand. How many fingers does it have? Five. So, in other words, God is giving you ten fingers, right? Now, for those that have ten fingers, there might be nine in there, I don't know. If you do, we'll just pray that God give you another finger. Amen. In other words, those ten fingers represent ten things you can do. And notice this, the thumb is powerful. You get that thumb caught off, you can't, can't really hold things right. You see what I'm saying? So in other words, why be concerned about other things when you've got your own? You've got ten things to do. Amen. You see what I'm saying? And see, that's what's happening. People... Not understanding the koinonia, the fellowship, they're wanting fellowship over there, fellowship over there. Come on, church, now, now I'm going to go somewhere. Fellowship over there, and they want fellowship over there, and they like the anointing over there, and they like the, the feeding ground over there. Oh, come on, church, can I stop or can I keep going? You see what I'm saying? They're wanted over there, and then they're wanted it all. And it's not given to them to have it all. You see what I'm saying? That's why it's important for us to get into your grace place and allow the, the pillar of d d doctrine to work strong in you and the fellowship and the koinonia and the relationship working together. Listen, oh, it's an awesome thing when you start understanding one another in that area of grace. Hallelujah. Amen. I was praying for Lorenzo today. I don't know what you're going through, brother, but I was praying for you strong today. Amen. And what is it? Why did God tell me to pray for him? Because he's part of this fellowship. And the Holy Ghost says, there is someone in the fellowship that has a koinonia, and you have a relationship, you have a, 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 a partnership working together. There's an anointing that is coming upon him and, and your life. You need to pray. You see what I'm saying? It's amazing how really what God does. That's why when God shows me someone to pray for, man, I tell you what, and if somebody of this house, oh my God, if it's somebody of this house, man, I jump quick out of my bed and I go straight to my prayer room and get on my knees and start praying. Why? You see, that's what God desires of that pillar, Koinonia. Amen. You remember when I told you we were in Mexico and, and uh, our, my life was threatened? Thank God for the church back home that was praying for me, praying for me. I sensed the prayer of God. Thank God for that koinonia. Amen. Tell me hallelujah. hallelujah. And it says, go with me to 1 Corinthians. And, and uh, that's why that prayer counter that we have, I spend mornings, uh, every morning in my office praying for that name and that name and, and that name. Why? Because see, it's important for us. Hallelujah. Amen. 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. We're, talk, we're still about that second pillar. Oh, we're barely on the second pillar. Amen. Well, God is good. We may have some more Sunday. First Corinthians, the first chapter, verse 9. God is faithful. God is faithful by whom you were called unto the communion or koinonia or fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. I want you to see this. God is faithful. God is faithful, meaning that God, and let me say it this way, God is full of faith to cover your need when you are faithful and you have the fellowship of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
See, when we're fellowshipping Jesus, he is faithful. God is faithful to honor us because we're fellowshipping one with another. We're having communion, koinonia, a relationship, a joint participation, a sharing, an intimacy. Come on, church. You know what I'm talking about? I, I love worshiping God at home. I turn on the CDs and worship God, and I get carried away in the presence. But there's nothing like being among the body of Christ, worshiping God together, drawing from his presence, entering into all that he has for us when we're all together. There's power in that. There's power in that. Amen. We, we've been looking at the CDs of our pastor's conference or our DVDs, and Pastor Christine said, you know, they're a good word. It's a great word. It's great. It's great anointing on these CD DVDs, but there's something still lacking. And I said, what is it, honey? She says, being there. You know what I'm saying? Being there. Being in the presence of the body of Christ together worshiping. Oh, it's great sitting down and watching the DVD, but it's not the same. <laughs> you know what I'm it's not the same. You know? you know what I'm saying? The doorbell rings. The dog barks. The phone rings. You got to go to the bathroom. Something happens. You see what I'm saying? But when you're in the fellowship of believers, man, bladder doesn't talk. Phone, <laughs> phone doesn't ring. Amen. Nothing bothers you because you're hearing God. You're hearing God in the fellowship. That's what it's all about. Kononia. Hallelujah. Say with me. Amen. I love that about Kononia. Hallelujah. Amen. Go with me to the, um, well, let's go ahead and look at uh, the 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Notice what it says in the 10th chapter. The 10th chapter of 1 Corinthians, verse 16. Now remember, the first pillar is doctrine. The second is fellowship, which we have according to communion. But we also looked the breaking of bread. Remember I told you breaking of bread, it, it, it's almost like the second pillar was his uh, fellowship, which is communion. But there's more to that, breaking the bread. First of all, let me just say this. Breaking the bread goes further. It's, it's, the, it's the holy sacraments that we take. We break bread together. But I notice this. Breaking the bread also combines itself with that fellowship. You know, when you break bread, have you ever noticed that when you break bread and eat together, it's, it's, it's a marvelous, it's healing time. It, it's awesome thing. It's a healing that takes place. There's a healing. You're sitting with somebody that you never ate before with, and you're just eating, but you're, there's something more to that. There's an anointing on breaking bread. There's an anointing on breaking bread. Now, notice what it says. This, this stood out to me in the, the 16th chapter, or the, or the 10th chapter, verse 16. Amen. Are you okay? 1 Corinthians 10, chapter, verse 16. The cup of the blessing which we bless is it not the communion of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Question mark. Here's the answer. For we being many are one bread and one body. For we are all partakers of that one bread. Do you see that? Come on, church. The Holy Sacrament, it is breaking bread. It's a reminder of the reality, of the objective reality of Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection and his blood. But now that breaking the bread, that third pillar that we're talking about, remember, doctrine? What was the second one? Fellowship? Breaking the bread? Listen to this. When you and I break bread together as a body, as a group of believers, is it, it not like the blood of Jesus. Do you see what's happening now? That's why I said there's an anointing when we break bread. It's an anointing when you and I break bread together. There's an anointing. When we go to dinner with somebody that, are, that is of the body of Christ, there is an anointing. I love that when there's that anointing. I remember uh, having breakfast with an individual that ministered in our city. And, and listen, I don't like pancakes that are dry. I mean, I, I put bananas on mine. I put jelly on mine. I put, you name it, apples on mine. I just, you ought to try some of my pancakes, hallelujah. I even put, if I have jelly, I put jelly on it, hallelujah. 
But this day, they didn't bring that. But I ate my pancakes. They were dry. And I had the most wonderful breakfast that I've ever enjoyed. And I said, wow, it was something different. Why? The anointing superseded what I wanted to enter in my belly. It superseded it. It was the anointing. Think about that. The anointing. Do you know what I'm talking about? When you and I break bread together, there's an anointing on there. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, church. You see what I'm saying? But have you ever noticed when you break bread with an unbeliever, there is no anointing there? When you break bread with an unbeliever, why? Because there's not that, there's not that relational meeting taking place. You see what I'm saying? In fact, to tell you the truth, I don't like going to dinner with people that don't know the Lord. I just don't like it. Well, Pastor, you ought to turn around. Yeah, yeah. But still, it's not right. It, it's, it's just out of order. Some, something's wrong. Hallelujah. Amen. But when you get together, come on, church. When you get together with one another breaking bread like we did Sunday, come on, church. Come on, church. Come on, church. When you get together, when you get together, going to somebody's house, go to Bo's house, and Bo, all he's going to serve you is egg rolls and rice. Oh, there's an anointing on that. Hallelujah. Yeah. Amen. Us guys went fishing. We, <laughs> we went fishing. And uh, I remember all I had was chili and beans. And I brought a lot of chili and beans. And I forgot to bring the rest of the food. So all we had for breakfast, right, bro? Chili and beans. Lunch, chili and beans. Dinner, chili and beans and some dirt. The next day, chili and beans. Lunch, chili and beans. Dinner, chili and beans and some rocks. You see what I'm saying? Oh, come on, church. Listen, they were the best chili and beans that I've ever had. Hallelujah. Amen. Why? Because we were the body of believers working together. Hallelujah. Enjoying Jesus Christ. And there was nobody. I know there was nobody that was sad or oppressed or divided about that. Man, even the non-chili bean eater was eating chilies and beans. Hallelujah. Amen. Right? See, so we have to understand something. There's an anointing. Look at this other scripture here. Oh, come on, church. Are we okay? Amen. So, so listen to this. The breaking of bread and the communion, we understand that it's, it's, it's joining of the Lord together. Uniting yourself together with other believers. When, when you and I break bread, we're, we're united in God. Amen. Hallelujah. Let me, let's go to the, the, the last pillar, just so we can go ahead and move on faster. Amen. The, the, the last pillar. What is it? Prayer. Prayer. All right? I wrote this down. I want you, I want you to write this down or, or remember it. Holy Spirit says prayer. Prayer is not optional. Prayer is not optional, but rather essential. Write that down. Prayer is not optional, but rather essential. We must be praying regularly. Regularly with other people. Believers, we must be praying regularly with other believers. You know, we pray here at this church. There, there's an anointing. I, I, we, I'm challenging us to get here 15 minutes early to pray. 15 minutes before service, everything stops. We go into prayer. The reason why we go into prayer is because we need God in our services. We need the Holy Spirit in our service. And listen. We're going to get into prayer. So in other words, it's essential. It's essential. It's essential for the survival of every believer. If there's no prayer, there is no moving on with God. Prayer is the communion, the fellowship, the, the, the hearing from God always. We're talking about God. Now I want you to look at Isaiah. Go with me to Isaiah and talk about a prayer here. The Isaiah, the 56th chapter. Amen. Isaiah 56. This, this, this is powerful. Isaiah 56, pick it up in verse 7. Now I want you to see this. Isaiah 56, verse 7, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Now notice this. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices, sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar for my house shall be called an house of prayer for all people. Holy Spirit says this, said this very clearly in this, in this right here as we read it. 
Offerings and sacrifices is what we bring to the Lord, right? We all bring offerings and sacrifices, don't we, unto the Lord? A lot of our seed is a sacrifice, so we bring it unto the Lord. A lot of our giving is. Um, I know that many of us come to church on a Wednesday after a hard day. You're coming to church, so in other words, you are sacrificing yourself to be here. It's a good thing. I, I applaud you. I applaud you for doing that. I applaud you. Don't give in to the weaknesses of the flesh. Pray that day. Believe God that that day, Wednesday, will be a day that will be the lightest thing that you can ever do that day. You know, we, we can pray that. We can pray when we go before we go to work and say, Father, today's Wednesday. I pray that today's most, the most easiest day for me because I'm going to the house of the Lord tonight. You see what I'm saying? And whenever the enemy brings an oppression and an overworking and tiredness, notice what he's doing. He's trying to keep you from going into the house of worship. He's trying to keep you from that because the word that you have, the word that God's going to give us that hour is a fresh word for that day. Amen. So in other words, he said this. This is what he said. He said, when you come bringing your sacrifices and your offerings, don't forget about the praying part. The praying part. The praying part is what connects all this together. In other words, when we give, we pray. When we pray, we receive. Hallelujah. You see what I'm saying? In other words, the sacrifice of giving of ourselves. I love that. You know, every time some, if you're ever sick, you ought to get in the house of God. I tell you what, a couple weeks ago, Pastor Christine and I were going through some physical challenges. You know, we were standing in faith, uh, and that mess tried to get on us, and we covered ourselves up in the blood. We went to the house of God. Oh, I got up here by faith in the house of God. Listen, I don't think you guys knew it, but listen, oh, I stood up here. Oh, I said, God, and I preached one of my best sermons. Do you know that? I preached my best sermon. Walked out those doors, and I was totally healed. Totally healed. Come on, church. You see what I'm saying? Don't forget about your sacrifices getting into the house of God and your prayers. Say with me, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's go to one more chapter. Amen. One more. Acts, the 12th chapter. Is it okay? All right, guys. Let's go. Let's go one more. Hallelujah. Acts 12. Now, now notice this. Acts 12. The tenth, the tenth verse. When you have it, say glory to God. All right. Verse ten says, and when they were past, when they were past the first and the second war, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord, and they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from them. Something supernatural happened here. Peter. Peter was in prison. And when Peter was come to himself, in other words, he was in the spirit, but yet the spirit moved him. I'm telling you, that's awesome. You're going through the first ward of the prison block under the anointing. I could just imagine Peter feeling the only God. First of all, the Bible says that the chains broke off him. Angel touched him and said, get up. He gets up and he's an anointing. Now, now, this is the way I see this. I see an anointing on him walking through the first ward, through the second ward, <coughs> unto, the, unto the iron gates. And he's outside into the streets and he says, what happened? And notice this. Notice this. this is for our education, for our teaching. All right? And notice this. The Bible says, now where were we, Brother Bob? What verse? And when Peter was come to himself, he said, Now I know of a surety that the Lord has sent his angels and had delivered me out of the hand of Herod and from all the expectation of the people of the Jews. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mar. Now, I highlighted this, where many were gathered together praying. Okay, stop there. Go to verse 5 of chapter 12. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. Verse 12. Peter went to Mary's house, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, 
where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter knocked on the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened up the gate of, for gladness, but ran and told how Peter stood before the gate. And they said unto her, Thou art mad. You're crazy. But she consistently confirmed, affirmed that it was so. Then they said, It's his angel. But Peter continued knocking. And when they had opened the door and saw, they were astonished. But he beckoning unto them with a hand to hold their peace. In other words, they were excited. Hold on, guys. Declare unto them how the Lord had brought them out of prison. Oh, God. And he said, Go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he departed and went into another place. Now, Notice this, the pillar of the church. Pray. He's in prison. The church is praying. The angel directed him out. The key that the Holy Spirit said, in prayer with the fourth pillar or the main pillar, the fourth pillar of a New Testament church, you're going to see the signs and wonders. Wasn't this a sign? Wasn't this a wonder? Wasn't this extraordinary? Wasn't this anointed time? Come on, church. Wasn't it amazing that the people were praying and they said, it's an angel. It's an angel. It's an angel. What's going on? They're in a high level of prayer now. Oh, come on, church. You see, you see what prayer does when you and I pray as the fourth powerful pillar of a New Testament church. When you and I pray, we draw in the presence of God. Angels are before us. The anointing is there. Signs and wonders happen. Hallelujah. Oh, come on, church. Come on, church. And I notice this. They must have been praying all night long. We ought to learn from that. They must have been praying all night long as a church. We in America ought to understand the importance of corporate prayer. We got to understand it. Listen, no prayer, no power. You want power in your lives? You want prayer? You want power in your homes? You want power in your marriages? You want power in your personal walk with God? Get hooked up in prayer of the pillar, the pillar of the church. Get part of that. Do you know we host, we host early morning prayer Every, every Tuesday. Now, this is, this is important. I want to tell you something. This is important. Every morning at seven, 6 o'clock, we hold prayer. And the hour goes by so fast that we're gone in the spirit praying. And notice this. We need to be part of that. And notice this. I asked the Lord, Lord, do you want me to hold another prayer meeting? He says, no, let them get used to 6 o'clock in the morning. I said, yes, sir. I want Sunday night prayer. Which would be easy. I thought, well, it would be easy for everybody to come to prayer. No, it's not about the easiness. It's about the dedication. You see what I'm saying? It's not the easiness. God doesn't work in that lifestyle. Well, he's going to make it easy for you. No. He says, you want me? You, you stick to it. You pray. And do you know what drives me out of bed every, every Tuesday? We're doing it now uh, five days a week. Not here at home. We're praying every morning at home. We have to pray. I said, God, something's wrong. He said, no prayer, no power. I said, okay, God, that's got me right. Now, church, let me just say something. Can you be part of that prayer? I think you should. How can I? You figure it out. Ask God to give you wisdom how to figure it out. I did it for five years in a row. Five years every day praying. Five to eight o'clock, five years praying at the church. In fact, pastor gave me the key to open up the church at five o'clock every morning. I said, dear God, pastor would be crazy. Amen. But I'll tell you what, after the first few days, I said, oh, this is awesome. After the third day, but I'll never forget the night, the morning that I went and prayed, I saw the feet of Jesus. Never have I ever seen anything like that but the feet of Jesus. I was literally, to tell you the truth, I was praying on the floor. And I was praying with my hands in this situation. I was just praying. All of a sudden, I smelled it. I want you to do something for me, right? Smell your Bible. Everybody smell your Bible. Doesn't it smell different? Come on. It really, seriously. You must think I'm, <laughs> I'm playing, but I'm not. I'm not. Smell your Bible. 
Mm. Ice melt, that's strong. And I remember that. Go ahead, smell you. Kids, smell the Bible again. Mm. Now notice this. I smelled it so strong, so strong, which I knew the smell. Because I've cried over my Bible a lot, and so I knew the smell. But I it literally just opened my eyes and I saw two feet that were scarred. And I knew they were the feet of Jesus. Oh, I cried. I cried so much tears that morning. And I didn't want to leave. Do you know? Five o'clock in the morning. Well, we turned on the, the heater. It was cold. I was the first one there. And then people started to come in. It was 8.30 when I got off from the ground. 5.10 to 8.30. I was in the presence of the Lord. Now, they had corporate prayer. I mean, I, I, I didn't hear anything. I mean, they, when they had corporate prayer, they had corporate prayer. We talk about a lot of people coming together to pray. And here I'm laying down. It was probably the second month of me dedicating myself to pray. I lasted five, four and a half more years praying, early morning prayer. It changed my life. Now, when I moved to Oklahoma City, a little modernism got in me. Well, I'll just pray at home. Do you know that's not easy? How many people know that it's not easy praying at home? You fall asleep. Come on, church. I know, I know. Come on, don't say it, it happens. No, it's easy to fall asleep at home. But there's something about getting up at five, taking a shower, getting dressed, get, making some coffee, and going to the house of the Lord. By the time you drive, open the doors, you come in, turn on the lights, you get before the Lord, and immediately you enter into the presence of God. You enter into the presence of God. I don't care what people say. You enter into that presence of God. And you hear from him. He talks to you. You know the voice of the Lord. He starts telling you how to pray. And then you pray. And then that day you see the miracle of that prayer. Oh, come on, church. You pray. And then that day you see. Oh, I'll never forget the day that we all took off in the spirit to, to the streets of Jerusalem. Oh, we were in the streets of Jerusalem in prayer. I opened my eyes. We, we, either it was by the Spirit or we were translating. But I'm telling you what, I walked this cobble streets and I remember seeing the wall, the wailing wall. And I was praying. I saw the people taking the mark. I literally was seeing people and I was praying for them. And then all of a sudden, I came right back into prayer. Oh, God, I want some more of that. I want you to experience that. I want you to experience that. I want you to know what that is. I want you to know why. The fourth pillar. Thank you, brother. The fourth pillar, the fourth pillar of the church is where he talks to you in prayer. And that's where the devil tries to keep you out of prayer meeting, keep you out of worship, keep you out of the fellowship, keep you out of the breaking of bread. Do you see the wiles of the devil? If he can keep you out of those four pillars, he's got your chicken. You see what I'm saying? He's got you. Hallelujah. Amen. But you come back to those four pillars and say, Father, today I'm building these four pillars in my walk. The doctrine, I'm getting it right with Jesus Christ. I'm getting it right with the communion. I'm getting it right with the breaking of bread. And I'm getting it right with prayer in Jesus' name. Come on, church. Stand up. Come on, church. I got, I'm getting excited. I'll, come on, church. Woo! Glory to God. Come on. Let's go to the Lord. Let's worship the Lord. Hallelujah. Worship the Lord Jesus. Come on. Worship the Lord Jesus. Ha ha. Worship him. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 See, it's the awakening that we're praying for. It's the revival. Could we receive revival? Or do we need to put it on a calendar and say, this is the time frame that I need the revival. And this is the time that I must be out of church. Now I think you need to say, you know what? Fully on my timetable. Fully on the calendar. I'm going for God. Oh, I'm going for God. I'm going for God. I need revival. We need revival. We need the awakening. We need the manifestations of God. We need healing. Oh, God. 
We need, oh, we need revival. Oh, God, we need revival. We need revival to revive the body, to revive the body, to revive the body. We need revival. We need revival, Jesus. Oh, God, we need it. Come on, church. Oh, pray. We need revival. We need revival. Pray, church. We need more of God. Oh, come on, church. We need more of God. 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 Oh, Jabrondo Sikiti. More of God. More of God. Oh, God, more of God. In Jesus' name, we need more of God. The great mighty revival of Azusa Street that happened in Azusa, California by a black man called William Seymour lasted three and a half years in California. One of the great mighty moves of Pentecost that came to our country and that's where the filling of the Spirit was. Of course, we know from the book of Acts it happened. Out of three and a half years, it stopped. You know what stopped that move? Man tried to put it in a box. And he said, you know, these all-night prayer meetings can't happen no more. People have to work. Um, we need to only have it on Sunday because that's the time people go to church. Boom, it stopped. From that moment on, there was never again a mighty move of Azusa would happen. From that moment on. So, what's the lesson learned? We need not to put God in a box. If we need revival, then we need to stick with it all the way. We need to have prayer meetings. We need to do it. Get after it. Hunger after it. Cry after it. Want more of God. Oh, I want more of God. I want more of God. I want more of God. Oh, we need more of God. Come on, church. We need more of God. We need more of God. Oh, shakam brundo sikiti. More of God. Come on, church. Oh, hallelujah. We need more of God. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Bram Brusi Brindisi. More of God. Oh, Jika. We want revival, God. Oh, we need revival. We need an awakening, God. Oh, Jesus. We need more, Father. We need more. We need more anointing, God, in our services. We need more revival. Jesus, Jesus. We need more of God. 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 Hallelujah. We need more of God. Oh, Jesus. We hear. We hear. We hear. We hear. We hear. More of God. More of God. More of God. More of God. Zika Brandi City. Oh, we need more of that. I remember as a little boy, the floor shaken. It was a wooden church. The floor shaken under the power of God. Not, not a wild shake, but you can feel it shaking. You knew something was going to happen in that service. You knew it, you knew it, you knew it. There was healings. They were going by. People's ears were being popped open. They had a trash bag on one end of the church where tumors were falling out of people's uh, bodies. People were vomiting them and to See the lame walk straight. I want to see people emptying the hospitals. I want to see the gifts of the Holy Spirit praying in tongues. 
I want to see that. I want to see the move of God. Oh, the move of God, the move of God. I want to see that. I think that's a cry that we all desire, right? We all desire, right? All right, church. I'm talking to uh, people that have to understand what's, what's, what's real, what's happened. If you've been saved within the last 10 years and never knew these things happened, I'm going to tell you something. It happened, it happened. Mighty revivals happened in the past. Re mighty revivals where in one building, a fire truck was called because they thought it was on fire. And when they got to the church, all it was was just a glow over the church. Oh, I want to see that. I want to see that. I remember one day after church, we're leaving and a car goes right through us. Right through us. Our children were little and that car went right through us. It was a, it was a miraculous manifestation of God's protection over us. And I said, God, oh, I'll never forget. I'll never forget that. That's the power of God. Oh, Jesus. I remember a woman that had a hip. She spent 20 years with her hip bent over. Her hip was out of place and she was just bent over. And in one service, I heard, I heard like a big oak tree broke and her hip popped back into place and she ran around the church and man, there was healings. I saw a woman's hand withered, withered in my eyes open. I saw the withering completely leave her body. Her hand became so beautiful, olive colored skin. I saw that. Before, minutes before that, I saw a pruned, dry, withered hand. Oh, Father, I, we need that, Jesus. We need that. We need that in this church, Lord. We need that, Lord. We need that, Jesus. And so, Father, we draw from your will. We draw from your will of your spirit. Father, let it be. Let it be. Let it be. Let it be in Jesus' name. I want everybody to raise your hands to heaven. Raise your hands to heaven. Father, as we raise our hands tonight, in a declaration unto you, we surrender. We surrender. And we allow you, God, to move mightily in our lives, in our church, in our homes. Today, Lord, we surrender. And we're not concerned about anything else but the move of God. We want more of you, God. So that when we talk about you, people hear and they give their lives to you, Jesus. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' wonderful name. Oh, Let's just pray in the Spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, It's a cry, Lord, of our hearts. Oh, Shakam, that did it more. Lord, Oh, Jesus. Oh, Zakata. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We're hungry and thirsty. After it, Lord. You'll honor us for that, Lord. You'll honor us, Lord. You'll honor us, Lord, for this. In Jesus' name. You'll honor us, Lord. In Jesus' name.
is so real. What happened in the book of Acts was written for you and I to understand the way it's supposed to be. But throughout the years, the enemy has weakened it, has put sugar on it, and coated it. And now we have modern types of services. Oh God, forgive us. Forgive us, God. Forgive us, God. Forgive us, God. Hallelujah. Amen. Oh, Jesus, we hunger after it, Lord. We want more of it, God. Yes, God. Let's understand the doctrine, okay? Let's understand the doctrine. Let's understand it all. So we we arrange it so we can answer it all. Amen. The move of the Spirit. I'm going to share with you the, what the Holy Spirit share with us in prayer. And it's all leading toward that. There's three points that we're going to work on this year. Three points. Three main major points. And I'll share with you as the Lord permits me to bring these out to you. Three major points that we the church are going to work on this year. And we're going to see God. We're going to see God. Do you know Colombia is having a mighty move of God? The Latin American countries are having a mighty move of God. Thousands of people being saved left and right. Brother, brother, brother Michael, right? Michael Figueroa was with us last June. Prophesied to him and gave him a word that he took to Colombia. In his home, he's got a he's got a an apartment. He filled it up with almost 95 people. That he couldn't fill them there, so he went to a hall where they have this dance. Over 900 people are showing up. He said, Pastor. It's so amazing to see the move of God here. He said, my son is baptizing people at a lake. Over 35 people are being baptized this very moment. He said, I pastored in the United States for many years and could never see this move. And I'm seeing it in Colombia. And this is what he said, this is what he said, this is what he said. He said, Pastor, I know God used you Give me a word to come to Columbia. And now I'm going to your church. And I'm going to minister what God's saying to us in Columbia. I said, yes, we need that. I need him to come here and minister to us. He said, I don't know when I'm going to go, Pastor, but let's pray. And I said, yes, sir, let's pray. Let's pray for the right timing. Now, after that, the Holy no, before that, the Holy Ghost gave me three points. And one of them was an awakening, a revival. Then Michael called me. I'm in the parking lot of Target. He called me from Columbia. And he said, I have a word for you. He says, you gave me a word from the Lord. And there's miracles happening in Columbia. Now I'm going to go back and bring what God's telling me to bring to you. Oh, yes. Come on, church. Get excited. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I want revival. <laughs> I want a mighty move of God. I want the hospitals to bring sick folks. I want to see the healed walk, hallelujah, the lame walk. I want to see it. I want to see it. I want to see the blind. Can you see that, church? Blind are seen. Can you see that? See it with me. Blind are seen. <laughs> Amen. The deaf are hearing. Oh, the cripple are walking. Baptism of the Holy Ghost happening everywhere. A mighty move of God. Come on, church. I'm hungry for it. I'm hungry for it. This is our time. This is this is this is the year of the church. Hallelujah. I'm ready for it. Get ready, church. Get ready. Get ready. So the five, the four pillars have to be effective. 
in our lives. Four pillars got to be effective in Jesus' name. Strong doctrine. Strong fellowship. Breaking of bread. And in fact, every third Sunday as we have communion, we're going to have some meals with you guys. After every third service, every third Sunday, communion and breaking of bread. Let's don't make it hard for us. Amen. Let's make it easy. Bring out the chicken sandwiches, the tuna sandwiches, the bologna sandwiches. Make it easy. And let's sit together under the anointing of God and have a great meal in God. Let the world say, I want to go. I want to be part of it. Amen. Anointing over a bologna sandwich. Amen. All right, good folks. God bless you. In Jesus' name. Go with the blessing of God. Go with the word of the Lord tonight. Say, I got the word of the Lord in my heart tonight, God. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Let's go with the word of the Lord. See, saying the same thing, speaking the same thing, believing the same thing. Hallelujah. For mighty revival. Hallelujah. Amen. I want these kids to see the move of God. Amen. I want that little guy to see the move of God. Amen. Hallelujah. I want Lot to see the move of God. Amen. Thing of the past. It's going to happen. Hallelujah, man. God bless you, church.